So today we're doing the differential. And the first thing we need to know is what is the backlash uh, required for this particular set of pinion and crown gears. And that's etched on the back of the crown gear, which you can see here, it's 0 0.007 of an inch, which translates into 0 0.17 to 0.18 of a millimeter. So that's what we're looking for. So I started by measuring the initial backlash that we had, and it was about 0 0.22 of a millimeter, which was not good enough. Spreading the case so I can lift the bearing out. I've measured this before so I know how many flats I can turn this to get the approximate spread that I need. Be very careful you don't overdo this because you can walk the case permanently. You can see that's quite loose now, that lifts frets. easier to slide in one of these thick ones so I'm going to take that out I'm going to take that off okay. I think that's right Yeah, you can see the, the shimmers in there. So that's in. Now, I think I can just slide this down in here because it's such a thick shim that it will probably go in, which it does. It's great. Okay, so let's knock this off. Release the pressure. So our 0.21 that we had before is still there, which means that that shim that we put in, all that's done is take up a little bit of the actual slot that shouldn't be there anyway. So um, we actually need to probably replace that and we need to add one in this side as well so that we, we tighten the preload evenly and then look for our slot. Okay, so we've put some new shims in here and taken one out of there so that we can move the um, crown gear across slightly to narrow the backlash. And now we're, I've put a piece of wood down here that I've put through the bolts on the pinion gear to hold the pinion gear firm so it can't move. And then when we rock this, this crown gear, we should be able to read the actual backlash. So I'm just holding it in one direction. And rock it forward, 17 or 0.17 millimeters, which is exactly what we want. Spot on. I'll take. Okay, so this segment sees the return of the body shell, which sounds like something of a horror story. And I guess if you have a look at the body and the rust, it actually is. Anyway, task one is to mount it up on our car shell rotisserie, which um, allows us to rotate the car around its axis and makes working on the bottom side and generally working underneath and, and, and on the sills and things uh, a much easier proposition by putting those areas in a, a more, more old person friendly location. <laughs> So it takes a little bit to get the body, uh, the rotisserie in exactly the right place so it rotates evenly around and doesn't flop from one extreme to the other. So, however, it's not that hard, it just takes a bit of fiddling. Once it's done, um, it's easy to do. So here you can see a picture of, uh, of the body rotated into the 90 degree um, angle. So I've decided to attack sort of the easy non-visible areas first while I restore my skills in, um, in welding. Um, so here's this funny looking corroded spot next to the batteries which is underneath the carpet on the rear pass-through tray. 
Um, so I cut that out, uh, welded in a patch, which came out pretty well, uh, and then ground it down. Uh, look, this is an area I can see from the other side, so I was able to check that the welds went all the way through and looked pretty good. And it'll need a little bit of filling to, to you know, fill up the edges, but I'm pretty happy how that came up. Next, I went around the, the whole body shell and found a whole bunch of little pinholes and things. So I drilled them out, punched out some little round discs of metal and, and spent a few hours just filling up little uh, little holes where the surrounding metal just had, it just had a pinhole through. So here you can see one of the typical plugs that I made. Next task was to replace one of the battery holder cross members. It wasn't too bad, but I don't want little rust pockets. So I ripped it out, fabricated a new one and welded it in. Um, came up pretty well, I think. The welding skills are getting better, but it's pretty tricky welding this really thin metal. Next was a funny shaped hole that was in the uh, chassis, um, sort of down under the driver's footwell. Um, so I cut that out, a little bit of a funny shape. It took me a while to make a piece that would drop into that cut out and fit tightly, but it came out all right. I uh, folded it in and ground it back, and that's come up pretty well too. So off to more significant things next. So then I decided to tackle something a bit more serious. This is the front chassis member. Um, it's just forward of where the suspension mounts, so it's not seriously structural, but... It's also where these two bolt holes are, is where the front sway bar mounts. So it is important that it's, that it's good and strong. Um, so this was my first major piece. So I decided what area needed to be cut out. I uh, launched into cutting it out, and then I made a piece that fitted in very well. It fitted in nice and exact. And I was able to weld that in place and then put the crossbar back on. And, and overall, I think it came up pretty well. Um, it's a slightly heavier metal than the chassis member was originally made of, but that makes it easier for me to weld. Pretty pleased with how that came up. So I think one of the hardest parts I'm going to have to do, uh, and it's hard mainly because I have to make all the bits from scratch, I can't just buy a panel and weld it in, um, is this area which is under the vent. Um, it's the heater box area, the heater mounts on top of this, and it provides a, uh, all the ducts that go for the heaters into the into the footwell. Um, somewhere along its life, it's obviously blocked up and it's filled up with water and leaves and things, and uh, it is corroded completely. There's very little of it left. There's actually quite a few parts to this. There's the what I'd call the main cover plate, which is this bit, uh, which forms the tunnel uh, if you like, that goes over the top of the gearbox um, bell housing. There's an inner plate that sits immediately behind that. And then there's the inner um, shell that that actually holds the two vents, which open up onto the passengers and the driver's side leg uh, areas. So, you know, you've got to peel the onion, as it were, with this um, and open it up and replace each bit, bit by bit from the inside out and probably going to need to replace most of this flat panel that sits across the top of the engine well as well. So I started off by making up a, a template uh, of this main cover plate, uh, which I, a bit of paper, held it in place with some magnets, uh, traced out the major lines and the bend lines, um, and then transferred that to a piece of uh, plate steel. Um, once I've made the template, I started ripping out that piece, which I've done here. And you can see that that cross member, by the time I drilled out all the spot welds, there's really not much of it left. So I'm, I'm going to remake that piece. Um, so then I fabricated up the cover plate, I'll call it. Um, I haven't yet bashed the, the curve into it, uh, which I'll do later. But at the moment, it's still flat does fit quite well and once I tap the edges back into place it'll actually be quite a nice fit. It's probably a little bit sharper in its bend radiuses than the original but I think by the time I bash out that hollow bit that's in the middle I'll, I'll soften some of those curves a little. So having made up some templates it was time to start chopping out the 
bad parts, <laughs> which obviously didn't leave much of the good parts. So here you can see after I've sort of removed that cover plate and exposed the inner sections of the, the various bits. There's about five different parts to this box. So you've got to build this up a bit like an onion and start with the back bit and then move forward because you really can't sort of build it in one piece because you can't get in there to weld the various bits. So I chopped out the whole lot and that uh, that left this large gap where there was the base piece and one of and both the sides. So I I fabricated uh, templates and you can see in this picture that we have a back piece which goes into the cabin and we have one side piece. That was about as complicated as I could make it. Um, However, before I really got stuck into that, I thought I'd better get the aperture part that mounts the actual heater box in the right place because it, it extends down into this area and everything needs to be right for the heater box to fit into place. So here you can see I've made a whole new piece for that top dash area and that particularly that brace that runs across the front has a double fold in it where the screws go through and it has some captive nuts on the bottom. It's quite a complicated little piece to make. Having made that, it was time to fit the heater. So I put the heater in, uh, marked all the screws, fitted the captive nuts, um, and that all fitted in pretty well. So from that, I was able to establish where all the, the pipes and things come into the back of the heater and where the vents need to go. Um, and so I could then proceed with doing the the inner baffles and parts which sit immediately under this. So with that done and everything marked up, I was able to fit this back part. Um, I cut a hole in the plate that I made earlier and flanged over the edges on it to give it some structural rigidity, um, clamped it all in place and then welded it up and it came up reasonably well. I, you have to excuse my welds, I'm not a really good welder, but it's strong and it's not coming apart. And uh, once I grind down the welds, it, it actually looks pretty good. And then I'll cover it up with some seam sealer and then some underbody paint and you'll never see it. So with that bit done, it's time to make the next baffle inside this. So this is a more complicated bit. It's got quite a number of edges and these funny shaped uh, bits where the two demister hoses come through and then join into the heater body. Um, this this took me a couple of goes to get right, I have to say, um, starting with the cardboard template and then um, flanging over the various circles and cutouts uh, is important because it has to give it rigidity. I don't have any fancy tools here, so I'm, I'm making Dremel templates and I'm flanging it over using a little tap hammer and, and a couple of metal pieces of scrap metal that I've got that happen to be the right shape. Um, and then grinding that down on the belt finisher. And oh, I don't know, it's uh, come up pretty well. And once it's sort of formed, you can see the hammer marks in it, but these are internal parts, so that isn't so critical either. And um, it's nice and strong and it, it, it looks really good. I'm pretty pleased with the way this has come out. Okay, so with the inner baffle done, I can now refit this outer baffle, and this is before I cut the hole in it. Uh, and getting the shape and the fit roughly right. The curve is now reasonably uh, faithful to the original. Um, here you can see what I've done is I've actually cut that area out. I decided I couldn't bash that bit into the right shape, so I've made it in two bits. I've cut the hole out, and then I uh, heated up uh, another flat piece and, and beat the curve into it. Um, and then I welded the two together, and, uh, and it ended up coming out reasonably well. It's a little more aggressive a curve than the original was perhaps, but it was really hard to tell from the bit that I had left. But I think once I've finished grinding it, um, this bit I probably will put a little bit of filler and effort into trying to smooth it out. So, And then I'll paint it with underbody paint, which will help hide up some of the little hammer marks. So the end product should look quite good. I have to say, I'm happy to be done with this bit. This is probably the most complicated bit of everything because I had to make all the metal work from scratch. Pretty much the rest of it is either fixing small holes, which is just patches 
um, or replacing the sills and the, and the floor panels, um, they're pretty much, you know, remove the old panel, weld in the new panel. So not quite as difficult as this bit has been. So for the next trick, I thought I'd uh, replace this top hat section. This, this uh, is at the top of the join between the A pillar and the front guard. And um, on particular, this is the right hand side of the driver's side one, which you can see is very rusted along the bottom. Provides a lot of strength to the front guards by giving that right angle sort of area there. So it's a pretty important piece, but good to get on to something else. So it's time to drill out all the myriad of um, spot welds, uh, which I've done here, you can see, and then cut the welds on the other, on the left hand edge. Uh, that's not normally welded like that, however, this car's obviously been in a bit of a fender bender and someone's put another one on the seam welded all the way along. So I had to cut all that out and remove it. Um, here you can see what it looks like on the inside. Uh, then I had to grind these corners back and grind all the, the bit where the spot welds were flat. Mm. And get it all ready to accept the new part. Okay, so the new bits are pre-made part, so just a matter of drilling out all the holes along the edge, um, puddle welding through the holes onto the original chassis, which my puddle welding is uh, solid but not pretty. <laughs> they look like rivets. <laughs> um, the other end, or the left-hand end, fits inside the chassis rails, or sorry, inside the other parts of the, of the frame here. Um, and uh, this is before I actually seam welded along those areas so I ground it all back and took that undercoating cover off and uh, seam welded up those areas that you can see. Um, they'll need a seam sealer all put on it later to stop water ingress but yeah, it, it came along okay. So this has uh, been fairly slow progress getting all these various bits done because of you know fabricating and bending and not having the right tools to do the bends and, and curves and all that sort of stuff and having to do everything with a little tap hammer um, has been tricky. Um, my welding skills are getting better, but they're still not particularly good. Um, you know, these are all pre-grinding and things, so there's a lot of dressing up that will go on here that, that will make it look prettier before it gets painted. Um, but I, I think in the end it's, it's pretty solid. Uh, well, very solid actually, so it's not coming apart, and it's a good gauge steel, it's 1.5 mil thick. This is actually a fairly important piece, a lot of this, uh, this bridges the two halves, the two bits of the chassis together in a lot of ways, so I think it's reasonably important structurally, so I've made it out of fairly hefty steel, and that contributed to the difficulty in actually uh, forming everything as well. Um, anyway, it's been... Uh, 40 plus degrees in the shed for most of this week um, so it's been pretty unpleasant i have to say um, still that's i think is one of the harder parts done and um, uh, the next stage is probably one of the big jobs it's to replace the sills and and um, and the floor pan itself uh, the rest of the body is actually pretty good now i think we've dealt with most of the bits of rust that needed to be dealt with and we can move on just as a footnote to some of the comments I've been getting on my welding, most of the pictures that I've shown you here are before I've actually gone and ground back the welds and, and dressed them in some cases, ground them right out and had another go at them. Um, I don't profess to be a good welder. So, you know, don't be too horrified by the welding. 